Good morning. And if you have been brought here today by a friend, if you've been dragged here, if you've been tricked into seeing this is the second wing of the VNA, if you've <laughs> been looking for the toilet and you've stumbled in here today, or if actually you just feel that this morning you're not good enough to be here, I want to say a massive warm welcome to you. Because I know what it feels like. I didn't grow up going to church. When I was two, my parents divorced, and my mum moved to London, and my dad looked after me and my brother and sister. He had to work three jobs, and we moved from council house to council flat to council estate. And whilst I went to school, I realised that actually other people's experience of home wasn't that similar to mine. A friend of mine, for a number of years, his mum dropped me off at school and would give me a hug and a kiss, so I didn't feel like I was lacking anything. And yet, whilst my dad was busy working three jobs to fend for us, the people who were asked to look after me and care for me actually abused me for a number of years. So much so that when I got to the age of 14, I decided to leave home. I thought running away would be the better option. I turned up to live with my mum in London. My brother and sister had previously moved up as well, and so I thought London held so much promise. The city of bright lights. It was exciting for a teenager. My mum worked nights, which meant that us three teenagers could do whatever we wanted. We could have parties, we could have friends over to early hours, we could go out, and as long as we were back by 7 a.m. when mum got in, all was fine. <laughs> and so I did, I took, took opportunity. And I was drinking what I shouldn't be drinking and smoking what I shouldn't be smoking. And by the age of, of 14, I was just a complete mess. Fast forward a couple of years, and I'm now at school where the police have a nine to five presence doing lollipop duty and lunchtime hours. And I was drinking in a pub with my brother, and in came a guy selling illegal DVDs. Do you remember those things, right? Now you just click the download button. But back in the day, you had to pay for this stuff. And this guy came in selling a load of illegal DVDs. So I went on, and I had a look at a load of them. And I found one that I thought had everything I liked in a film. It had blood and gore, and it was set in an interesting time in history. And I really enjoyed reading, and it was subtitled. And so five pounds later, I was the proud new owner of the dodgiest copy known to mankind of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. <laughs> and so I went home, and I watched it. And I was overwhelmed by what I saw. Jesus. Was this the same Jesus who a couple of my friends had told me about? Was this the same Jesus who I'd sung carols about? Was this the same Jesus who Mrs. Williams, when I was about eight, would play songs about? Was this the same Jesus who I mocked in assemblies? Could it possibly be that same Jesus? And so when one of my school friends said, do I want to come to church that same week? After a thousand times of asking, I replied like every teenager, filled with energy would do. I was like, yeah, all right then. <laughs> and so I walked through the doors of the church, and I met loads of smiley people. I heard some really energetic music. I even was slightly engaged by a sermon about holiness. What is this place? And yet, overwhelmed by the feeling that I just was not good enough, I wonder how you feel this morning, whether you feel good enough to be here, whether actually you're at the end of your rope. Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians, to a church that knew they weren't good enough, yet were experts at looking like they had everything. Most of what they were doing was spot on, yet they were starting to bring back old customs. They were buying into other philosophies. They were trying to find things that would make themselves look holy, make themselves look good enough rather than trusting in the one who is holy, the one who is good enough, the person of Jesus. The truth is, we all know we're not good enough. And so what do we do? Fake it till you make it. Act as if, or as Aristotle said, to be virtuous, one must act as if a virtuous person should. Shortly after becoming a Christian, I bought a Bible, and I'd been going to Bible studies for a couple of weeks, and I realized that when someone said, should we read our Bible, you pull it out of your bag. And, then, and so what I did is I went to a Christian bookshop, 
and bought a Bible. I took it home and I quickly grabbed a highlighter and I highlighted through a load of verses and I wrote in the margins and I rubbed it on the floor loads and I even covered it in gaffer tape so that when it came to that part in the Bible study when someone said, should we now open the Bibles? I could bring it, it was massive. I could bring it out, throw it on the coffee table and everyone go, wow, you've read so much. How have you read the entirety of scripture in one week? I'm like, well, you know. We live in a, in a world that says if you don't have what makes you feel good, you can have it instantly. That you can download the episode now rather than waiting a whole week. Do you remember when we did that? A whole week until the next episode. You can have the credit without needing to save anymore. You can have the weight loss cosmetically without the tedious work of a diet. You can have the date without the courtship. You can even have the goods without having to shop for them. The world says you can have everything now. But is it truly everything? It might be stuff. It might be great feeling. It might give us a good sense of purpose or self-worth. But is it everything? The New Testament, as you'll know, is written in Greek originally. And the word used for rooted is instantaneous. Like on or off. There's no in-between. And the word for built up in this text is an ongoing process. However, both are framed as a choice. Are we going to put down roots? Are we going to surrender everything to him? Because if we don't bow the knee to Jesus, we are free for anything else to take us captive. There is freedom in total surrender. And that is the gospel of Jesus. Paul is encouraging those in Colossae not to put their faith in a system of righteousness or into a set of habits to make themselves holy or a way of avoiding worldliness, but instead put your faith in something that isn't a feeling, that isn't a state of mind, that isn't a qualification, but is a person, Jesus Christ. Paul writes, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Because when we give our everything to Jesus, he doesn't give us back a religion. He doesn't give us back a tradition. He doesn't even give us back simply teaching. Instead, when we say yes to Jesus, we receive Jesus Christ himself because Jesus is everything now. But how does Paul know this as he's writing this letter? Apart from Paul's own personal experience of meeting Jesus on that road to Damascus, we simply have to look at the life of Jesus to see this at work. And one of the most powerful examples of this in practice is Jesus' account of the woman at the well found in John chapter 4. Because where Paul says, be wary of philosophy, there was a philosophy in the time where those who lived in Samaria and those who lived in Jerusalem did not mix, that dated back hundreds of years. Where Paul says, be wary of human tradition, there was a human tradition that said, if you're in a state of public shame, whether by legal crime or moral scandal, it's best if you get your water when no one else is around the well, probably the hottest time of the day. And where Paul says, be wary of basic principles, there was a basic principle where if you were a good rabbi teacher, then to protect yourselves from rumors of whisperings, it, it's best to protect yourself. And it's probably not a great idea to spend your time with married women alone, unmarried women alone. And yet John 4.4 4 says this about Jesus. He had to go through Samaria, where others take a detour, where we try and protect ourselves from people to keep ourselves holy, where we try and avoid those areas of our life that are tough, where I found it really hard moving back to London because of all the baggage it held in my past. Jesus has to go through it. Jesus asked the woman at the heat of the day for a drink, and she says, but you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because when you're not in the in crowd, you're only too aware of what disqualifies you. When you're not part of this group over here, you're only too aware of what's keeping you over here. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
He goes on, everyone who drinks this water from the well will be thirsty again. But who drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. When we put our roots in Jesus, it's no longer the wisdom of the world, the rules and regulations made by human hands, the customs and religions that refresh us, but the very person of Jesus who gives us all we could possibly need right now. The good news of Jesus is that everything is available now through him. For in Christ, as Paul writes, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's everything, everything in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over power, every power, and every authority. In Jesus, there are no hidden extras. There are no bolt-ons. There are no special tariffs. There are no secret knowledges. There's no terms nor conditions. There's nothing left for the elite. There's nothing reserved for the super holy. There is nothing because Jesus is everything now. You can be truly free when you put your roots in Jesus and allow him to build you up. The letter to the Colossians continues saying, having been buried with him in baptism, and raised him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. The Christian walk is a walk from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from death to life. Two months after I first walked into a church, I answered the call from the front that if anyone would like to give their life to Jesus, if anyone wants to become a Christian, if anyone wants to put their trust in him, then come to the front. And I eventually did, and the reason I could say yes on that day was because of three things. Firstly, when I first walked into church, I remembered something. I remembered that I'd been at the back of a school assembly when I was about nine or ten, and a group had come into school and given us a load of Bibles, New Testament and Psalms. Do you remember the type? It looked a bit like this. In fact, it was that one. And where my, a load of my friends had burnt them on Bunsen burners in science or used the papers for smoking paraphernalia, for some reason... I kept hold of it. I kept hold of it, and I I just put it in my bookshelf. And years later, I had found it again after I got in church, and I dusted it off a bit, blew the dust out, highlighted some passages, covered it in gaffer. (laughs) And I suddenly encountered in the pages of this book a Jesus who doesn't wait for the super holy to come to him, but he goes out and eats with tax collectors and sinners. He doesn't simply wait for everyone to have theology degrees or qualifications. He walks with his suffering disciples to explain their pain with them. He doesn't simply only hang out with those in church. Sorry, guys. But he's often out in parties, at wells, looking compromised, hanging out with those who didn't belong here. I suddenly met Jesus. And then I flicked through the Psalms and I saw this I saw these words that managed to hold pain, hold anger, hold stress and anxiety, whilst presenting it in in an act of worship to God. And I was suddenly introduced to a God that didn't want me to be sorted before I accepted him. That all he wanted was an open heart. All he wanted was my all. And that might look broken, that might look disheveled, that might look poured out. That's all Jesus desires. And then he'll give us his everything. That was the first reason. The second reason I could say yes on that Sunday afternoon was that I'd suddenly worked out what the church was. When I first came to church, I thought it was just a building or an institution or a religion or something where I was not welcome. And yet very quickly, I discovered that the church is the people. There were three people in particular that really spoke into my life. One was a science teacher who stopped me from being excluded at one point because I got into a fight. And she said, I won't exclude you. I'll only suspend you. So I come back up the days later. If, if I choose to meet up with her at lunches and chat to her about what's going on at home. And then I worked out that she was a Christian. And, that that, and she saw me with compassion on that day. And the other person was a guy I sat next to on the bus on the way to school. And he would ask every Monday, how was your Sunday? When he found out I was going to church. And I would ask him some questions about the sermon, and he would just answer it back, and he would often pray for me. Great guy. And the third was a girl in the youth group. 
who I was able to phone all the time whenever I hit across a, a certain bit of scripture that I didn't understand or I, I didn't know, and she would make up some kind of answer or text a youth pastor and text me that. But I suddenly worked out the church was the people. That was the second reason. And the third reason I could say yes on that Sunday afternoon was that I could not deny the work of the Holy Spirit. That inside me, I started to see my character change, my anger fade, my anxiety decrease. I started to see around me a load of people who no one, nothing else had brought them together, only that they had all been impacted by the work of Jesus Christ. The thing that brings us all together is that we have one hope, and that hope is a person, and we can meet him by his spirit. And so I said yes that day. Are you going to put your roots in Jesus and be built by him? Putting roots down happens in an instant, but the building up takes time. Between the ages of 14 and 20, I struggled with a sleep disorder called insomnia. I never slept. I'd have small little micro sleeps, but I never slept at all, really. And when I did, it was filled with nervous dreams, anxious dreams, disturbing dreams. And often I would get out of bed and I'd go for a walk around London. And then I'd go back home and then wait until the alarm ticked over to 6.30 or whatever it was. And it ruined so many things that I held dear. It ruined relationships because I was cynical and grumpy. I messed up my A-level because I fell asleep during it. It hurt. It hurt. And, and I was struggling with this. And eventually I was on medication that didn't seem to work. And so one Sunday morning, I sat right at the back where I used to sit all the time at church. Hey, guys. <laughs> and halfway through the sermon, the sermon stopped. And suddenly, they, they brought in the kids' groups, a load of eight-year-olds. And the very, very passionate kids' worker, who was far too loud for that time in the morning, said, well, we've been learning about the power of God and how he likes to heal. So who would like these young children to pray for them? Come forward now. No one moved. <laughs> and I sat at the back, and I wasn't moving. But I saw the one little kid who I really liked. You're not meant to have favorites, but I had this one. And his little lips started to tremble as he saw that no one was moving. And he started to get really upset and distressed. And my heart broke. So I just got up. I didn't know what I wanted prayer for. I just didn't want to see tears on a Sunday morning. I'm not ready for that. And I came right forward. And they said, what would you like to pray for? And I was like, oh, uh. And then I remembered. I was like, Actually, I don't really sleep very well. And so these kids surrounded me, and they prayed lovely things like, uh, would he have a comfy night's sleep? Would his dreams be lovely? And all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> nice try. But that night, I slept. And the night after that, and the night after that, and I've never since had a struggle with sleep at all. Those children were the church. You don't have to be Apostle Paul. You don't have to be Peter. You can be an eight-year-old who prays that I just have a comfy night's sleep. And Jesus speaks through that. Jesus' power in that. Because we may have everything now. The planting, the rooting is instant. But the building up takes time. When my wife and I moved house, I found one of her teenage diaries, which is one of the funniest things to read. Um, there's poetry. There's all sorts. It's marvelous. We're going to get it published one day, I think. <laughs> However, I came across this one page that looked cryptic, looked like something out of the Da Vinci Code or something strange. And it was a series of initials. I think we've got a picture here. She'll love that. Um, I've had to blank out another bit. But this is a prayer list that her and her sister had written in 2004. And as you'll see, at the bottom it says, Alex Insomnia. So they were praying for me in 2004 when I was 14. It wasn't until I was 20 that I was healed from it. However, the row above that, list of initials, James, Gemma, Elliot, Nancy, Catherine, Alex, and Ollie. And that was all for them to become Christians. Two months after that date, it's in the top right-hand corner, I became a Christian. And every other one of those initials at some point in their life has either become a Christian or met with Jesus or been to church. The power of the church is remarkable. <laughs> My roots were planted in Jesus, but the building up took time. 
It still takes time. But with Jesus, the tools are always available. Are we going to choose to put our roots in Jesus and see how he does the building up? There's three ways that often happens. We get built up by his word as we hear sermons, as we open the Bible in one year on the way to work, as we listen to sermons and as we listen to worship music. We're being built up by the words of Jesus Christ himself. Are we going to be built up by his church? As we receive encouragement, as we receive help and support, as we receive prayers, as we receive the love for one another, are we going to be built up? As we go to connect groups, as we, go, as we come to church, are we going to be built up by Jesus' presence on the earth today, his church? And the third way we can be built up is by spirit. As we pray daily to be filled again, are we going to be built up by Jesus himself, by his spirit? Because we can have everything now in Jesus Christ. He has done it all. He makes us alive. He forgives our sins. He cancels the written code with its laws. He takes all that stuff away and nails it to the cross. In Roman culture, when a Roman king was killed, the troops would take the body back to Rome to show everyone what the might of Rome looked like. But they left Jesus hanging on the cross, not knowing that he would be of any worth after his death. Just another ego-driven teacher. Little did they know that the one they sarcastically named the King of the Jews would be resurrected and would offer you and I true freedom by his spirit two millennia later. And as Paul continues, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Because this is what God does. Since becoming a Christian, I've experienced so many accounts of reconciliation. I now get on remarkably well with my parents. Where, where as a teenager, ed- education, I did not see eye to eye. Because of the funding and the love of the church who paid for me to do, do extra education, I've developed a love for study of the Bible. That I, I just, If you had asked my English teachers back in the day, they would be astonished. I've been a youth worker for the past 10 years, working in all kinds of contexts, from public boys' schools to working with gangs and inner-city culture. And yet the message is still the same, that whilst our past may describe us, no longer does it have to define us. When we put our roots in Jesus, it's his fruit that we will see. When we give our yes to Jesus, we put our roots in him, and we will be built up by him and strengthened by him, because we can have everything now. And then, of course, we will experience what Paul says being overflown with thankfulness looks like. Because when you've been saved, when you've been rescued, when you've been redeemed, when you've been set free, you've got to tell somebody, right? When you've received freely, you can't but be thankful. The thing is, I'm the most generous with other people's stuff. And all that Jesus gives isn't mine to keep hold of. All that Jesus gives is to be given away. It doesn't belong to us. Let's receive all that Jesus has so that the world may hear the same good news that Jesus is everything now. I'm Bear Grylls. My favourite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.